Okay, well, we'll get started. Uh, a quick shout out to the AV people who've just saved my bacon. Uh, my computer was not working and they've turned up with a new one in record time. So we can actually get started on time. So thank you, AV people. Uh, so um, hopefully you're here to hear about developer tooling for Kubernetes configurations. Um, so uh, I, I work for Puppet and there's a few bits of like the background to this talk is rooted in a lot of my experience with as a user of Puppet and then at Puppet, but it's not really a talk about that. But if you do want to talk about Puppet, come see me later. Uh, I'm Gareth R, basically everywhere on the internet. Uh, I do the DevOps Weekly newsletter amongst other things. So if you, if you don't know about that, you should read that too. Uh, this talk is going to cover a sort of infrastructure as code and testing infrastructure as code and why that's relevant and sort of prescient even for the Kubernetes community. I'm going to talk about uh, sort of specific types of testing um, that is useful to do for configuration. Uh, I'm going to talk through a bunch of demos and examples. Uh, they were going to be live demos. Uh, my, my laptop doesn't work. If, they, if you want to see them actually working, come see me later. So who in the room is familiar with the term infrastructure as code? Lots of people, excellent. And, uh, Who's, who's actually had experience with I mean, like using whether it's Puppet or Chef or CF Engine or Ansible or yeah, so maybe again, like a similar number of people, about half again. Um, and Wikipedia puts it like this, and sort of it's a process of managing provisioning computers through machine-readable definition files rather than physical hardware. I mean, like, this is how most people are interacting with Kubernetes today. They're definitely writing machine-readable definition files. Uh, we'll come back to whether YAML Handwriting YAML is a good way of doing that later, maybe. Um, stepping back, I mean, so that concept has been around a while. That's not come from Kubernetes. It's not come from Puppet. It predates that. But one of the, uh, roughly 2011, something interesting happened. And actually, it wasn't just our spec Puppet. The, uh, there was Chef spec as well. It was the same year. There was a few other tools. Um, and our spec Puppet uh, was a was a tool for using the Ruby RSpec testing library to validate and verify your Puppet manifests. And so ChefSpec was exactly the same. And this idea definitely does like sort of span different communities. Um, and the sort of Puppet Lint and Food Critic from the Chef world and, and a, a number of others. I'm, I'm less familiar with some of the Salt and Ansible testing stuff, but I think there's some tools there. Um, and those tools have really stood the test of time in those communities. Um, they've been around a while, they've matured, they've ended up in the sort of the actual, like, the best practice way of doing things. They've added value. Um, and I think it's an interesting sort of journey with respect to where we are today with, like, configuration files for Kubernetes. Because you start asking the same questions in those worlds as well as this one, um, which is fundamentally people are like, but it's just a declarative thing. I'm just saying this is what, I, this is the state of the system should be. Why would I test that? And I think it's a valid question. And I think as an observation, um, and increasingly that configuration, once you're past that hello world, once you're past that first example, once you're past that sort of that first application with a few deployments, um, and you're into multiple teams and multiple bits of the organization, and you're into how many YAML files, um, you start seeing um, patterns emerge. You start seeing templating in some cases. You start seeing high-level tools in others. Uh, you start seeing logic, you start seeing uh, wanting to pass arguments. Uh, you see interactions between different bits of configuration. Interestingly, those points were not written for this talk. They were written for a talk I gave four years ago about testing Puppet. And that's one of the reasons why I think it's sort of, it's this interesting comparison. And, and as I'm, who in the room is as actually is using, uh, or who in the room is just writing sort of like vanilla files. They're just writing like the YAML files. Um, and who is using a sort of Helm or Ksonnet or, or Kedge or Capitan or Compose and higher level tools? Yeah, a few hands as well. Like sort of, I think this is the direction that at least a, a chunk of the community will go as, as these tools mature. And, and, uh, and as an example of actually a really good sort of public example of, of a a more real-world deployment. Um, the Bitnami folks have got a Kube Manifest repo public for a bunch of their services. Um, and if you go through, there's actually, uh, they use uh, JSONIT, which is basically a, a sort of like 
programming language for JSON data. Um, but they've got 2,000 lines of that JSON it. Um, that actually expands into more than 7,000 lines of JSON in their case. Um, so you might knock a few lines off for YAML, but same sort of order of magnitude. And this is not actually, I mean, I think they've got a few clusters in there. It's not like organization, large scale size. Um, but that's a lot of content to not use something like JSON it or a high level sort of programming tool. Um, and there's actually loads of those about. Uh, I'm, this isn't really a talk about that, and this is sort of a side rant. But I think uh, Brian Grant, as part of the setting up the application definition working group, uh, went out and found, I think, I think he has a list of 43. Uh, I can't list all of them. I presume no one else can. But there's definitely, like, that, that number points to people with a sort of a challenge, a problem. Um, and I don't think it is that there's one answer. The variety of tools and the different types is interesting, sort of side conversation. If you're interested in that, come and join the application definition working group um, that's starting to get going and talking about this. Uh, we've had a few meetings, but not much else yet. So the sort of crux of this talk is that I, I posit that the lessons learned applying testing practices to infrastructure as code apply and will increasingly apply to Kubernetes configurations. And I want to talk about some concrete examples of tools you can use today to sort of start seeing if that actually helps your development. And I think in particular helps you scale Kubernetes across teams, across organizations. But if you look at those tools, if you look at the sort of the reasonably mature sort of set of testing tools from some of the configuration management tools like Puppet, you sort of see they break down into sort of, you know, there's often something that deals with validation. And I, is this going to be valid? Um, there's sort of linting. There are practices that the community has come to that says, you know what? These are good default practices. Um, you have unit testing where these are probably more assertions that you're making that are specific to what you're doing or your organization. And you often have acceptance testing as well in terms of just verifying it at, at a much higher level. Um, and this is true as well, and outside those sort of declarative programming tools. Realistically, if you look at testing tools for Java or Python or JavaScript, then you'll see this sort of set of things emerge. And I want to sort of start the conversation and, and maybe answer some bits of like, what, what would tools to address these problems look like for Kubernetes? So the first one I want to talk about is, is validation. Um, so really, it's starting to ask the question, is this a valid Kubernetes config file? Um, you don't have to answer that. Uh, you probably don't want to answer that either. Um, and this is just as much text as I could get on the slide, a uh, reasonable size that hopefully people at the back can see. As we've just seen, that even in a reasonably sort of smallish sort of set, you're into thousands of lines of this. Are they valid becomes a difficult question. Uh, is this valid? Um, if, if people want to answer later, feel free. It's, it's non-trivial. Um, and it sort of gets worse when you actually introduce higher level tools. At the same time, it's getting better. So uh, Helm uh, uses templates, or other, there's a number of other tools that use templates. And this is probably a good way of reducing the, the number of lines you write. But it doesn't change the number of lines that you output. And you start then asking questions like, well, is this valid? And the answer is, it depends what's in those variables. Um, and you can go on and on through all of the tools. Is this Kedge configuration valid? Is this Puppet Manifest valid that generates the Kubernetes configs? Any higher level tool suffers the same thing. It's like, are these valid? One of the really handy things here, and one of the things that really got me into Kubernetes to start with, was the strength of the API primitives. Like, I, I'm, I background as someone who ran things, more recently as someone who's been building tools for things. Uh, I've not had to deal with any of the sort of, I guess, the stability and sort of the growing, like, sort of instability of Kubernetes two years ago in production, and people have got battle stories. I didn't have any of that. I was running small clusters because I was building tools against them. So I got obsessed with the API really quickly. And you have these like, really strong primitives like deployments and pods and services and controllers. And they're sort of the, the 100 and odd more now. 
This is all described in uh, basically using uh, OpenAPI, what was originally Swagger. Um, so there's a Kubernetes description of the entire API that's also generated from various different places in the, in the Kubernetes code. Uh, I, can't, I, I can't show that. I've sort of brought this up as a slight, in slight jest because uh, I think it's to now 85,000 lines of JSON that describes the Kubernetes API. Uh, again, you're thinking, well, that's not something that people can read. That's something that tools can use. Um, one of the things about the sort of the direction of travel with OpenAPI, there's multiple different versions. Kubernetes is using version two. There's some good stuff in version three. Uh, I think I talk to API machinery folks about that. Um, OpenAPI descriptions use JSON schema internally to describe the, those types. So what is a valid pod? What is a valid like, pod spec within the context of something else? Is all dis already described in JSON schema in the OpenAPI description. There's some fuzzy bits there that I won't go into because I'll rant for 10 minutes. Um, so what I went about doing when I was sort of thinking about well, how can I validate all of these things, because I want to do it client side. I don't want to have a server for every version that I want to do something with. Um, I actually extracted out of the OpenAPI schemas uh, the JSON schema bits and then broke that down into separate files and broke that down by versions of Kubernetes. Uh, I need to automate this a bit better, but ultimately there's a repository uh, filled for every single version of Kubernetes uh, with an entire set of JSON schemas for each of the types that we deal with. Um, and there's ones that roll that up. There's a bunch of different flavors. Um, turns out that's a really large amount of JSON. Uh, this got out of hand quite quickly. I didn't really think about this. Uh, as I said, the, the, the Swagger spec for, well, the open API spec, still called swagger.json in the repo is about 85,000 lines. Uh, that's 25,000 files in that Git repository uh, amounting to 7.5 million lines of JSON that describe the shape of all of these primitives in Kubernetes for every version of Kubernetes in a bunch of different flavors. Um, again, they're like, that's knowledge you need to validate something. That is not knowledge that any one sane person could have in their head. So there's, oh yeah, and actually, and that's on top of that, there's actually all the equivalents for OpenShift as well um, published. So there's, they extend the API in a few different places on top. So there's separate specs for that. Um, for those that are familiar with JSON schema, um, all those that are not, it's, 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 it's just a way of describing a schema for a JSON document in the way that a database schema describes a schema for a database. Um, and there's a whole bunch of sort of low-level tools. There'll be libraries in most programming languages that you're using that adhere to JSON schema. Um, so grab the sort of the uh, canonical sort of Python client, and you can do JSON schema, uh, point it at here, like, well, a Kubernetes config, hello to nginx, um, and I'm grabbing basically just the file off disk and saying, well, grab me the standalone uh, deployment schema, because that's a deployment. And it's saying, well, actually, that's missing a template. Template is required property. Um, this is a useful integration point for other tools. So if you're, if you're building something and you want to have validation in your tool, then you can just use the schemas. From a user perspective, this is not very approachable. This works, but you need to know a bunch of information. Validation is useful for a bunch of different things. Uh, I'm catching simple typos, fast feedback. All of this is happening on the client. It's all happening locally, um, or it's all happening in your CI system. Uh, Checking against multiple versions of Kubernetes is a, is a good one there as well. You, you might be running multiple different versions in different places. You might be looking to update. You might be looking to make sure you're not doing something that's going to cause a, a migration to fail later. That's all sort of valid use cases. And that's where kubeval comes in. So uh, this has been around a, a bunch of months. So there's a few people using this as well now, um, but I've not talked loads about it. So four months gone into this picture, if I took that recently. Um, all this is is a nice command line interface for validating Kubernetes configurations. So I say like you can do it with the JSON schemas. This adds a tool on top that gives you a friendly UI. So you can see you can sort of pass the different versions. You can ask whether it's OpenShift. You can actually host and generate your own schemas if you're adding custom resources. And it's very simple. And you can either just point it at a config file 
Um, and it will give you some information about uh, issues that it finds. It will exit with a sensible status code, to, so you can use it as part of a pipeline. Um, it will take things on standard, standard in, so you can just pipe things through it um, as a sort of chain. So it's hopefully a, a nice, small, well-behaved little testing util. Um, and it works with uh, basically like multiple declaration files. So basically, if you're putting multiple bits in there, it will, it will do the right thing. It will tell you about each of the files independently and fail if there's any failures in one of them, et cetera. Um, and I mentioned as well, you can run it for specific versions. Uh, it would be sort of nice to do this with multiple versions and pass a like, sort of comma separated value. It doesn't do that yet, but that would be nice. Because um, I think this is one of the sort of like useful features. Uh, it's implemented in Go, um, and so it's actually available as a library as well for other Go tools. I, I think that's pretty new. I'm after as much feedback on that as possible, because I'm not sure the interface is right, but it does work. So, I mean, Kubeval is useful now. Um, I'll, have, I'll have some demos of actually tying it in with other tools uh, a bit later on in the talk as well. So, once you have validation, um, you sort of, well, you do find that that's not enough. Um, a number of people have said, oh, that's, oh, that's handy, but, but. Because um, realistically, valid validation says something is valid, but it doesn't say whether or not it's what you intended. Um, it will blithely let you do silly things uh, as long as they're valid. So talking to lots of people and, and some of my colleagues running Kubernetes, everyone ends up with this script um, or a lot of people end up with this script that they run against all of their Kubernetes configurations in, in probably in their CI tool of choice that checks a bunch of different properties. Um, so I did a talk to a bunch of people in person that I knew were already doing this. I sort of put some stuff on the internet and we talked about it at SIG apps. And a bunch of people sent me these scripts. Um, and nearly everyone was like, oh yeah, we haven't shared this because it's really janky. It's like just this, like, like this script, it seems like a good idea at the time we had two things, and now it's like loads of things with a load of logic, and it's really useful. We're, we're like, we need it, but like, yeah, we're not sharing it because it's like horrible. Uh, that came up, like, I'm not going to name any names, but like, like half the people said something similar. Um, but it, to me, it's valuable. Like, the, the fact that people are using it, they're doing it, it's, a, it's an emerging pattern. Um, what I'd like to see is basically a, like, a way that we can share and use sort of similar tools, and not everyone has to go through the same thing. And it becomes a better, like, more, there's more awareness of it. Because there'll be lots of people thinking, oh, I haven't thought about having a script that checks my code. Um, and this was sort of Brian saying, like, their internal tooling includes a, something that lints their rendered Helm charts and validates certain rules. So talking to a bunch of people and uh, sort of looking at a bunch of these scripts, you see a, a number of different types of things people regularly do. And ultimately, you have these data structures. But lots of people I say, well, I don't want peg, pod specs without resource re requests. Like, my cluster runs into problems. The operators will hate me. Let's make sure that no pod specs don't have resource requests. Um, uh, I, me and Liz Rice did a talk yesterday about like, building things on top of metadata. Um, I, if you're building things on top of metadata and labels and annotations, you need to make sure your labels and annotations are there. So it's really common for people to say, like, things must be labeled with these things. So Maybe a label that says uh, this service or deployment is owned by this team. Otherwise, I'm not, it's, I'm not deploying it. Not happening. Um, preventing uh, usage of latest images, again, sort of, again, like, uh, you'll read a lot of the sort of best practice type stuff community saying don't do, do that. How do you make sure people aren't doing it? You have a script that reads your data structure. And there's a number of other sort of examples of the types of things people are doing. Um, so with all of that, I wanted a tool that made that sort of both easy for you to write those types of scripts, but also then hopefully share them with the community. Uh, and so I've been working on a little bit of this. This is uh, Kubeval's pretty mature. There's a bunch of people using it. It's sort of 07, or sort of it's had a few releases and a bunch of bug reports. Um, Kubetest is brand new. I sort of shipped this a couple of days ago, so it will definitely have issues. But I think the, the approach is hopefully interesting, and this talks partly, if it has one takeaway, is like, go have a look at this and tell me whether you like it or not. So what Kubetest does is basically allows you to write tests against your configuration. Um, basically writing assertions, again, for those types of things or others. Um, and again, it's packaged as a small CLI tool. 
you run it against your config files, um, and it will output uh, information about passing and failing assertions. Uh, and again, in a similar way, you can pass things to standard in, and it will hopefully be well behaved. It will output status codes sensibly, so you can use it as part of a pipeline. Um, tests themselves are written in Skylark, um, which I'll, is a, I sort of considered writing this as basically like, uh, like with like existing unit testing tools. Um, what I saw with what sort of different organizations were doing was some people just wrote a script. Some people were like, oh yeah, like this fits with like how you write unit tests. And they would write unit tests and they would use the, the tooling around the unit test framework. The problem there is simply everyone prefers a different language. Um, and the, it's less the language the problem, it's more the runtime. Um, Ruby as a language might be easy enough to go like, hey, it's Ruby. You can, if you can program a C-like language, you can program sort of Ruby a bit, like just for something that's very domain specific. On the other hand, now you need to know how to manage and install Ruby, and no one wants to know that. Uh, I, uh, tell, ask me how I know. Um, so Skylark is actually is a dialect of Python, so it's actually super familiar to anyone who's programmed anything like Python or sort of also like C bits and pieces. Um, so it's untyped, dynamic, high-level data types. Um, we'll show some examples. But the reason I've picked it is basically it's designed to be embedded in other tools. So you download kubetest, and that's all you need. That's it. Everyone gets the Skylark interpreter packages as the tools. There's no other runtime. There's nothing else to install. Um, and kubetest is written in Go, so it's basically nice uh, static binaries for different operating systems. Uh, I think. But like for me, and I'm interested in feedback on this, I, I'd like a tool that facilitates sharing. And I think the moment you go into different language communities, basically it's harder to share practices across them. So hence, an, in, a, an embedded language. And I went for Skylark over something like Rua or MRuby for sort of well, experimental reasons more than anything else. So what, what does that look like? What do tests actually look like? Well, here, here's a few examples. Um, I mentioned that sort of idea of saying, well, oh, like, we don't want latest images. Well, here's an example. Um, so, well, again, you can sort of read the code. But basically, if it's a replication controller, let's loop through all the containers uh, in the template. Um, let's extract the tag. And let's assert that it's not latest. Um, testing the minimum number of replicas. Again, similar. We're saying, well, replication controller. Um, grab some information from that structure, make an assertion. And that's the pattern. That's the, like, and you might have some, get, some gates. Uh, you'll probably have some extracting data out of templates, and you'll have some assertions. Um, and I say that's Skylark as a language. The things to note are the, the sort of special bits that Kubetest brings are spec. That's the, ob that's the Kubernetes object. That's the, like, that's the deserialized like, from YAML or JSON or other tools. Like, that has the Kubernetes object in. Um, and the assertions, basically, kubetest comes with a number of uh, sort of 10 or so like, common assertions for common things. So uh, do, uh, like, assert contains, uh, fail, um, uh, not equal, equal, assert true. You, like, common assertions uh, that you'll find in unit testing tools. And there's not much magic. Uh, so another example uh, mentioned sort of enforcing labels. It's as simple as something like this. Uh, also worth noting that like you can, and these are very direct. If you had a lot of them, well, you can write functions. You can write your own in Skylark to be used by others. So you could boil it down to your own DSL if you chose. Um, for example, the sort of there the spec template metadata labels you could take that into a variable somewhere and then just use it everywhere else. So kubetest new. I would love some feedback if people are writing these scripts or not. Um, please have a look. Uh, I mentioned linting earlier, but sort of went to unit testing first. Because I think what we, uh, like organizations having their very specific rules, like, oh, it, you must have a team label, and it must be one of these teams. Um, is really useful, uh, and you can't, that's, a, that's not a general problem, that's specific to your, like, patch. Um, but there are things where they're probably useful 
so like best practices for anyone starting out. Um, and what I would like to see is basically like if, if, if people like KubeTest, can we build a KubeTest test suite that we use as that sort of common best practice starting the like linting tools? And again, that becomes rather than you have to write everything from scratch, it becomes, oh, I have these ones that everyone else thinks are good. Oh, and I disagree with that one, and I've removed it. Oh, I've disabled it. Again, really similar to like, your typical sort of PyLint or like, uh, RuboCop type linting tools. And that's part of this track. Like, it's about developers actually using Kubernetes. And for that, we need developer tools. So yeah, that sort of common, like, I think the idea of encapsulating those sort of emerging community practices in code is a worthwhile one to pursue. We probably don't have many today, but I, I would wager that over time we'll have more. And having them in code is better than a Word document. Uh, so yeah, I'd like to make maybe sort of like an out of the box experience for KubeTest or something similar, or a separate repo with a bunch of sort of common tests that is actually collaborated on by loads of folks. Um, I'm gonna talk about a bunch of this stuff at SIGAPS when I get a chance. I had to finish writing things first. So this was where I was going to uh, dive into uh, live demos. Uh, unfortunately, I can't, uh, as computers. Luckily, I, I have slides for everything, which was a good job in hindsight. So imagine I'm actually typing for a bunch of this stuff, and it, and it will be more interesting. Uh, so one of, I mean, some of the design decisions for some of these tools around uh, being well-behaved, like, command line tools, be like standard in, standard out, error codes, was because there are lots of different tools in, in using Kubernetes for generating that configuration, like from just handwriting YAML to templates to custom templating like engines to Helm to case on it to Puppet to Kedge. Like, there are loads. Having testing tools for individuals, individually for those, is probably not the right answer. Um, some of them will have them, and Puppet's already got good testing tools. Uh, JSON it actually has a testing library. But the more you write tests for those individual tools, the more you're locked into those tools. If you can write your tests in something more general, you can swap the tools out at the same time as have your tests. And I think that is really powerful because what, like, the tools are going to get better. You might just today be running Kubernetes in one team in a small scale, and you've just handwritten everything because you're getting started. But imagine if you can write your tests and then port your tool, and you know your tool is working because your test is passing. That feels a useful property. So uh, lots of the tools in the Kubernetes ecosystem sort of follow that, that ideal as well. Um, yes, you can use Helm to actually ship your application to Kubernetes and talk to the API, but you can also use the Helm template subcommand to generate them. So if we were to run Helm template, uh, in this case, Nginx from the Helm examples, it would output a load of JSON or YAML. I think it's YAML. Um, and again, if, in here, if we pipe it through kubeval, well, we can verify that that's valid. Um, and nicely, it is valid. I was happy with that. Um, I was thinking, like, oh, I, I, I hope this is not an invalid one, because that would, that would be bad. Um, we can also write tests in exactly the same way as we've been looking at for our Helm charts. Um, and kubetest will work just as well with Helm charts as it will with like handwritten uh, Kubernetes configs. So uh, JSONit and, and the JSONit library that basically uh, provides a lot of sort of helpers for Kubernetes configs is again a really uh, an interesting tool. I've done a bit of pieces with this. This is uh, partly with the Heptio and Bitnami folks. If you've not seen this, I would, ha I would have a look. There's been some talks on it already. Um, you end up writing in a much higher level language. Um, so you can see sort of variables. And if you, if you sort of squint, you can go like, oh, yeah, there's a, there's a container. And there's a deployment. Ah, and the deployment contains, contains the container. Ah, yep. And if we run uh, JS well, basically JSON it against that, it would output the JSON file, the JSON for Kubernetes that matches the API. Um, Interestingly, uh, the case on it library is actually built from the open API spec. So the, there is actually less of a need of this here because this should always be valid. Um, 
Having said that, it's because that they're, it's built from a single version of Kubernetes, it's useful to be able to validate it against maybe a different one. Um, gets into sort of a bit meta. Um, but kubetest works exactly as well with, uh, with uh, KSonnet, JSONnet, as it does uh, other tools. And again, like, JSONnet has its own testing tooling, but having tests that are useful for all of your tools, irrespective of what anyone is using, I think, again, it has useful properties, not just the ability to move tools, but also the ability for different people in your organization to use different tools. Um, uh, similar with Puppet, you can write Kubernetes conferencing in the Puppet language, Puppet ESL, with a whole bunch of ab abstract things there. You can use Puppet Kubernetes convert to generate uh, the JSON, and you can pipe that through Kubal and Kubetest. You get the idea. Uh, like, this is, broadly speaking, should be true of well-behaved other tools in the Kubernetes ecosystem. Anything that can output to standard out or anything that can output to a file um, should work with Kubeval and Kubetest. Um, as I said, the, the, there are a few people using Kubeval already. Um, Brian from uh, Sky in the UK uh, sort of made this observation on Twitter. Um, and obviously, I've, the sort of demos, examples, have been interactive. They're useful locally. Um, but actually, if you're in a team, if you're in a group of people doing things over time, you'll probably want to integrate them into a CI system. So I've got an example repo that I, uh, I'd, I'd sort of talked about this, and I thought, ah. And so an hour ago, I wrote a quick example. Uh, there's a Travis example of just do, of doing exactly this. So all Travis does is pulls down kubeval, kubetest, and actually Helm. Uh, it takes a, a, one of the Helm examples and validates it against, uh, if you squint at the bottom, there's uh, basically a matrix build for different environment variables for different versions. So this gets tested against uh, a bunch of different Kubernetes versions, and then it runs kubetest with some assertions in there. Um, and so adding that and like sort of to Circle CI or Jenkins or Travis, uh, whatever, um, is, re is really simple to do. Um, and I I'd like to make it a bit simpler. At the moment, it's sort of explicit. There's a whole bunch of, like, uh, we're getting tar lines. Uh, it would be nice to have sort of one of those, like, one line installer type things. So, uh, coming in, sort of concluding, I say, if people do, if people want to see these things in, actually in action, uh, come and see me later. Um, uh, the community is definitely still exploring different ways of writing Kubernetes configurations. I and mean, that sort of tool explosion is part of that. Um, but Kubernetes, like, as a, like, now, I mean, one of the sort of themes of the conference, I guess, has been, let's get a lot more conversations going about running things on top of Kubernetes, not just Kubernetes itself. The project, over time, should be the boring bit. And um, the things we can build on top should be more interesting. I think the better tools we have there, the easier that becomes and more people approach it. Um, one of the things that I think I keep coming back to and again led some of the design decisions is this concept of the configuration complexity clock. Um, everyone sort of wants there to be one tool. And that idea of 43 tools is sort of quite scary. Um, and over time, they'll probably be winners and the things sort of become a bit more niche. Um, but it nearly never it co collapses to one or two or even three. And part of it's this idea of, well, actually, hard coding sometimes is really nice. There's nothing in your way. There's not another tool chain. There's not another thing to learn. There's not something that's different to anything else anyone's doing. But that can be really verbose. And you add templating and variables. And it's sort of nice, but then runs into other problems. And you then end up sort of in a, well, can we have a sort of rules engine? Can we have a domain-specific language? And you get cross all the way around. There are, there are trade-offs, there are pros and cons. Um, and it's often based on people's sensibilities individually, but also the organization they work in. One tool probably won't work for everyone, but actually, if you can have build tools that are composable, like with the testing stuff, that can potentially. And as I mentioned a few times, some of them do lend themselves to native testing. I mean, if you're using the Kotlin DSL, which is really nice, um, like you could just write your tests in Kotlin. It's not as portable or as understandable for 
the bigger, broader community is something like, hopefully, Kuba and Kube test. So making them, like, one of the things I'm trying to do is build tools that are portable. And I'd love to know whether that works for people. So that, I mean, that's sort of two things. I think there are other, er not two tools, rather. There, there are other areas of testing for Kubernetes that I think, like, if we can jump ahead and go, like, what does the development environment look like for where you're building things with Kubernetes? And if, you're, if you are sort of totally abstracted away, it's the tool builders that need these tools, not you. Um, but if you are building things like natively on Kubernetes, these things become interesting. What other bits of testing would, do we need? Without good testing tools, you don't really attract the best developers. And when I, I know whenever I like, look at a new la programming language, I'm always like, well, what's the testing approach? I want to learn that for, like, as well. I think once you get into more programming languages, that's a common pattern. We need that to bring more application developers to Kubernetes. Because there are, there's loads of inspiration we can take from, and not just the sort of, I, I've sort of come from that sort of configuration management space, but what tools are really good in other, spa other spaces? And there's whole areas of sort of interactive debugging that I haven't talked about, but like other people will have lots of experience with. There's lots of inspiration we can take from things that have worked. Can we jump ahead by just getting some of that done now rather than realizing we need it later? And with that, I am, I'm done, and uh, thanks for sticking around. And